H&M is the official partner for season two of the Fashion and Color podcast, partnering with Harlem's Fashion Row for two years in a row for our Sustainability Summit. H&M is revolutionizing fashion by turning recycled materials into breathtaking, eco-conscious collections, such as Heron Preston, to reshape the fashion landscape through collaborative efforts like the H2 Collection. They are not just crafting clothes, they are crafting the future of fashion. So on today's podcast, we have the Abrima Aria <laughs> from Studio 189 in with us. I'm so excited to talk to you. I'm excited too. Like, first, how are you doing? I'm all right. It's a beautiful day. It's a little cold, a little cold, but it's a beautiful day. So, Abrima, I was at Leading Women Define recently, and I wore your black and white dress. I think it's mostly black, white print. Every single time I wear that dress, I get so many compliments. You look it's so good. It's so good. So good. It's so good. Uh, so let's start with, I like to start with kind of your journey. What was your journey into fashion? Wow. Okay. So. I know. Big I know. question. Big, big, big question. question. Big question. Trying to find a way to say it quickly. Um. You know, mine is a little, mine's different. And I think understanding my journey kind of makes one understand kind of where I am now and why I'm very mission driven in the work we're doing with Studio 189. So rewinding it a little, I'm half West African, half American. It's important for the interconnectedness of what we're doing. So Ghanaian on my father's side and Ivorian from a tribe called Inzima. And my mom is from Mississippi, mm. you know and then moved um, to Pittsburgh during the Great Migration, and then um, we found her way to New York. And my journey actually began before I was born. Mm. I actually don't talk about this a lot. So when my mom came to New York, then later her sister came to New York. So my mom, and I don't give her enough credit for this, was one of the early black models and one of the first black stewardess to fly mm. in the planes. And then her sister also wanted to be a model, and they wouldn't let her model because of her dark skin and because she was tall. And she ended up getting a photographer to take a picture in 1967 times, um, and became basically one of the first black supermodels, Naomi Sims, in 1969, wow. on their cover of Life magazine. And the reason why her journey is, I think, and their journey is connected to my journey is because I saw firsthand the power of what beauty can do to make a difference for other people, right? Like, it's not just an image. They wouldn't they wouldn't take a person like this because they didn't perceive them to be someone who could sell product. Like they don't mm. see you necessarily or see you able to do that. And this is the 60s. Mm. So now I then went through this journey. My parents um, and my dad and my mom and my aunt started a company called Naima Sims Beauty Cosmetics in the 70s. And then I came later, I had a great upbringing. And I just remember sitting like fast forward years later in my job and being like, how are we so many years later, and we're still having these conversations. There was a year when uh, a big name brand had 69 models go down the runway. And this is not that long ago, and none of them were of color. Mm. Like, come on, like, right. how, how are we here right now? Right. And so I just remember thinking, I have had these great opportunities, and I have to figure out like where my voice is. And more than that, I remember thinking, you know, in history, we talk about all these incredible people that changed history, but we don't oftentimes talk about the people whose stories we don't know. Mm -hmm. It could be the person who opened the door for you, mm -hmm. who said, who saw two names and couldn't pronounce one, but pushed your resume forward, who supported you with a dollar. You know, like there's so many people that stand behind the people that are famous. Yep. And at some point I had this kind of like, who are you gonna be? You know, mm. which version are you gonna be? So that's like one part. But another part is I, I also just love creativity. I've always loved creativity. I've always loved fashion. I've made little knickknacks when I was mm -hmm. little. I've always been entrepreneurial. I used to make those little friendship bracelets mm -hmm. and sell them mm -hmm. in the, the lobby. You know, I made little knitted sweaters and all these types of things with my friends growing up. And so there was a lot of that. And then my first fashion job actually was at a boutique in Soho mm -hmm. called Living Doll. Mm -hmm. um, and I really loved it and kind of started the path to working for fashion brands and the luxury brands. And I have a real big passion for working with like upstarts, I think, like you. Yep. <laughs> you yep. know, like really like ro the raw of it, the yeah. kind of creativity and seeing what happens when we collaborate and we yeah. come together. So that's kind of the thing. And then connecting the dots. I also like, I have that kind of left brand, right brand thing. So I also like, you know, 
business and science and yep. how do I find a way to kind of connect a love of design and creativity with the love of impact work and, you know, moving the needle forward to make space for other people, you know, with a love of like kind of scientific methodology and systems and business. That's, that's my salad. Do you think that it takes courage oh, yeah. to create? Yeah. I think it takes courage, yes. I think you have to be really having faith in yourself. And even, I think you doubt yourself all the time. Like when you're creating something, at least for me, I I almost never think it's good. Like I, I'll make something, uh, and then you make something again, and then you try again, and then and then you think it's great. You're like, man, I'm really good. <laughs> like this is really good. <laughs> But then I'm like, I don't want you to see it, though. Like, it's not ready yet. Uh -huh. <laughs> like, and that's where, like, I think teams come in because teams are like, no, it's good. Like, you're good. Like, don't, right, don't right, do right. anything further. Right. We're going to take it from right. here. But, I, you know, I think it takes a lot of courage to put your, especially if you're trying to, you know, because you're putting your entire soul into this creation. Mm -hmm. And why are you really doing it? Like, who are you even doing it for? Like, this is, especially the ones you really love, yeah. right? Like, it's it's from deep inside there's something you're trying to communicate. There's a story you're trying to tell. There's a message. You know, there's a lot of elements. And, like, you're kind of, your mind is kind of constantly going. I feel like the pieces that the audience sees is like a microcosm of what's going on yeah. in your brain. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 How have you been able to keep creating over the last couple of years through grief? Yeah. Like, what has that been like for you? That's a really... Interesting question, and no one has ever asked me that. Um, so, for context, my father passed um, mm -hmm. a, few, a couple, a little over a year ago, and it it wasn't just the passing; it was it was the whole lead up, right? So mm -hmm. it was like everything you have to experience watching the like somebody going, mm -hmm. you know, and what that looks like, and also like. Um, your parents are, you know, you're a reflection of each other. Mm -hmm. So it's all, like pieces of you are also going and coming out of what we are all coming out of, right? Mm -hmm. Like this was also, it was a lot of grief, right? Like there's the pandemic, other people were grieving. And then there was the post pandemic mm -hmm. and this kind of like after pandemic that we don't talk about, mm -hmm. you know, and then all of that. And then your personal situation. And at the same time, you know, you have to be like, mm -hmm. you got to kind of show up you know, because you're showing up for other people. Right. And and um, I particularly was like, I think we were launching a collection. Mm -hmm. We were, I was presenting something with IMG. A week later, we were launching a collection in the Hamptons. And then we had the show. And I wanted to like, I was like, I need to stop. Mm. And I probably should have stopped. But how I did it was, I think it was the universe. You know, because mm. you know, we all have our different faith. It was whatever you believe in. And I think that's also the, that's kind of the calling of Studio 189. Mm -hmm. It was bigger than me. You mm -hmm. know, like I was like, I cannot do this, mm -hmm. you know? And I have a thing about like being on the ground. Yeah. I, I like to sit on the ground. I like to be close to the earth. Mm -hmm. And I kept going towards the ground. And I was probably doing also, not from the ground, but I think part of me was starting to do this. Mm -hmm. And then something happened where maybe it's surrender, but something else happened. And I started to do this and 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 use it as and channel it. You know right, what I mean? Like, right. like I would look out and look at the light and be mm -hmm. like, "What a blessing to have this light!" Wow. You know, like and listen to birds and and then like and then I would think about like I remember the biggest thing. My aunt sent me this amazing photograph of my dad, like it, probably in the seventies. I don't mm. even know, maybe like before he even knew I was ever going to exist, mm. right? And it was like a series of photographs, and they were like amazing. It looked like a Malik CD Bay or like these really incredible photography style from back in the day, black and white in Africa, like studio photography. This guy was like, he loved fashion. Like, uh -huh. He was like, he was like, he was like doing these. He had Kente. Uh -huh. He had his outfits. I was like, okay, you know. And when I saw it, I was like, yes. That's the person I know. You know, that's mm -hmm. who I am today. And I thought about like all the all the immigrants and all the people that have come here, you know, with the dream of what they could do for their children and mm -hmm. their children's children and setting up that legacy. And I was like, that's what we need to do. We need to tap into that because it wasn't just an image that's an inspiration for someone else's campaign. 
that's our DNA. Right. That's our history. Right. You know what I mean? And when I looked at that, those like it was a series of photos, like maybe five or six. I was like, we all have them, but they're not just stories that you put on a billboard. That's our history. Yeah. So how, when we have an opportunity to tell our story, how are we going to show up? Mm -hmm. And so it changed the way I looked at it, and I used that kind of as a guiding light. Mm -hmm. And then it just like it just started to happen. Mm -hmm. People would call me and say, hey, I was just thinking of this idea. And I was like, I was thinking the same, you know, and it was mm -hmm. like people would come out of nowhere and it was exactly what I wanted. So it was like dance performances. Mm -hmm. But the way I would see it, like, you know, all white and telling this like beautiful story, mm -hmm. children, remember, yeah, I, you yeah. know, little kids, because we were trying to talk about life and creating life, you know, and like a woman who was pregnant ending the show about the future. We did an opening because, um, you know, in Ghana, we celebrate the dead like it's mm -hmm. very important and, and like you know you either were black and red or you were white so we were white mm -hmm. and it was just like this beautiful like moment where we called on to spirits and we were just like very very mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. you know and it was really like that's what we were doing and the dancers were like you because, know because yeah. sitting at sitting at your show i remember i think feel like you did a tribute mm -hmm. to your dad everybody was so emotional mm -hmm. It was so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, also, uh, it, it was around 9-11, right? Yeah. So, like, the year before and that year. And, you know, and also, like, it's it's like, we, it wasn't meant to be sad. It was emotional, it but was it was beautiful. also joyful. Yeah. And it was like, because we're all going through it, and we never get a chance to, like, collectively grieve. And it was like, look, we've got, you know, it's supposed to be 12, probably 20 minutes <laughs> of a fashion show. Let's do this one together. Mm -hmm. And then let's be in our joy and let's be in our celebration. And that's what we... That's what we do. But in the context of the creative, I was creating from that place. Mm. So I was I try to channel like everything and then like push it back out, but then tell the the bigger story, right? Yeah. So like the music, the scent, the dancing, we make custom music or we use our friends' music, the fashion, the order of things. The whole thing is like very cinematographic. You know? Yep. So yeah. So let's go to the origin mm -hmm. of Studio 189. Yeah. You were working great corporate jobs. Yeah. Like, really great corporate. Who I are know. some of the companies you worked for? I know. I know. <laughs> Sometimes I really think, what, what did I do? We're not even going to work. You were, what were some of the companies you worked for? Uh, well, before I left, I was at Bottega Veneta. And I had, like, an amazing job and an amazing apartment and an amazing life. <laughs> you know? And, like, God only knows where I'd be right now. But it's okay. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, I was at Hermes. I mean, I was at Pachotti, um, luxury shoes. Um, and then I went to Hermes for a bit. I went to Bureau Bitac. Yep. And then I went to the carrying group, Bottega Veneta. And then. And then what was, what was, what was the thing that made you go, okay, I can keep living on this trajectory mm -hmm. or I can start Studio 189. I, you know, and what was that? What kind of made you go, I'm going to go all in with Studio 189, and what did you yeah. feel at that moment? Yeah. Was there any fear? Friend us with the question. Was there any <laughs> Oh, my God. That's an excellent. So the reason I, I'm smiling, I think it's an excellent question, is the all in part. That's mm -hmm. a, and that's because you're an entrepreneur. Yeah. There's a difference. <laughs> yeah. There's a difference between starting a company and going all in. Very different. There's a huge difference. Yes. A lot of people say they have a company or they're doing something. That is not the same thing is going all in and Not that is so such a great <laughs> I'm like I'm just gonna take a second like wow yes because I actually like I'm a I'm obviously like an over I think a lot I, I kind of overanalyze and I had it you know for years before I actually bit the full bullet and I love this question <laughs> and so I was like you do it <laughs> you know like I, was, I have this great idea I'm gonna do a company this is like brilliant I have all these cool ideas I have lots of ideas. let's do these things and then I was like okay so I'm gonna set it up and then you, you do it and I'll just like help you sometimes and who I did tried you want that. to do it oh, my sister she's the best my <laughs> sister actually when she, I was like you this is great for you you do these things and good. <laughs> you know and, and I was like setting things because I didn't want to stop like I like you said I had a good job I had a career I had an apartment I had a trajectory I was okay um, and it just life doesn't it just doesn't work like that you know and like I you really got to go all in you know and so I such a good question <laughs> I um I I didn't I wasn't ready you know I think uh, there's there's a timing for everything and but I was so interested 
an impact work. You know, I think a lot of an entrepreneurial journey is it, it has to also find you, right? Like there's, you can have a great idea you could say this is exactly whatever, but there's so many great ideas and there's so many people with great ideas. There's got to be like this kind of sweet spot or magic that has to happen. What is it like? You have to be prepared. You have to know what you want to do. You have to have a plan and strategy. Then you have to have like space, mm -hmm. right? Like space to let it happen mm -hmm. and for it to find you and for it to tell you what it wants to become. Mm -hmm. And then you have to pivot, right? Mm -hmm. Like, And you have to be like, okay. I saw that go, ooh, you know, like mm -hmm. a little bit of this. And so for me, I I was interested in impact and I loved the work that I was doing. But like I was saying at the beginning, I just couldn't help but not notice, you mm -hmm. know, like notice that I was oftentimes the only one in certain spaces, oftentimes, and not just of color, but women, like mm -hmm. in a lot of spaces, like where's everybody? How's this mm -hmm. possible? Where are we going? Where am I going? Mm -hmm. um, and what am I working towards? Like, I don't want to be the only one in any capacity. Like, I want to come up together. I want to be in community with other people. Uh, and I, it just felt like that was one thing. And then all this incredible work supporting artisans, which I love and seeing the impact, seeing the dignity, People tell stories about their kids and their families and living with dignity and grace. And then I would go visit other countries, mine included, and that just wasn't the case. People were begging for aid, for charity, for a dollar. Girls are doing all kinds of things they shouldn't be doing. And I was like, this doesn't, this isn't working. You're like, what do I do? So I started doing charity work. And luckily I work for a European company, so they don't work in August. And I would take August off and I would go volunteer. Um, and... You know, and I would say, I have this great idea because it was, everything was siloed, right? It was like fashion, it was beautiful, it was glamorous, it was gorgeous, and that was that, it was aesthetic. And then it was business, and that was making money, and then there was like people who care about people, and that was, you know, they used to call it granola, or mm -hmm. <laughs> this or that, and like it was stuff you didn't really want to keep or wear, and you bought it because somebody was crying, and, and there was no... <laughs> I'm sorry, yes. And there was no intersectionality, uh -huh. you know? And I was like, is there not a way that we can make these things work together? And that's what I was like, and I was writing plans. You you do it <laughs> to mm -hmm. the organizations. And they were like, that sounds great. But they really didn't know what I was talking about. So you were taking your plan. And I was giving it. 189. And giving it. Oh, my goodness. I was giving goodness. it. You do okay, it. Okay. I, I have done yes. something just like that. Yeah, you do it. I'm, I'm okay. Yeah, I'm like, doing, I have a nice life. I've got this great idea. And you should do it. <laughs> and it should be out in the world. You do it. So here, you do it. It's fabulous. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. Yes. I bet if I call uh -huh. them, like, you remember that thing I handed you that you didn't do? Yeah, I'm doing it now. Yeah. But so I did that. And they didn't do it. And they didn't move. And then I learned of the work of Muhammad Yunus, who, if you don't know, he invented uh, social enterprise and microloans for women. And this idea that a lot women are not deemed were not deemed credit worthy. Mm. So it could be just fifty dollars. Mm. Like somebody might need fifty dollars to fix a sewing machine, and like that, she flips her whole family, mm. and they couldn't get fifty dollars. Mm. And, and and it turned out that actually women pay like ninety nine point nine 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 percent of mm. all credit, and 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 that was social enterprise. And so I was like, yes, that's it. I want to do business, but I wanted to have impact. And mm -hmm. so I wrote a manifesto, and I guess I sent it to some friends. And Rosario Dawson, who's my current business partner, she we don't she doesn't completely remember, but she bit, and she was like, "Come with me to the Congo." So Rosario sits on the board of V Day's, um, V Day, so V, who's now formerly E Vinsler, and V Day's uh, dedicated to stopping violence against women and rape, and had at that point raised over hundred million dollars towards that purpose. Mm -hmm. And together with a doctor called Dr. Mugwebe in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, created something called the City of Joy, mm -hmm. which is a leadership center for women who had been the victim of rape and sexual violence. I thought, I was like, yes. <laughs> and when she asked me, she was like, who can I ask? And for me, this is important because years before, when my grandmother had passed, and I'm saying all this because hopefully this will all help somebody, but... You know, I, I needed to go back to Ghana, and I didn't go because I was, like, too young then. I didn't have the money, and I didn't have the voice. I was too junior to say to my boss, like, I need to go to Ghana because I knew that if I said words like Africa, they would become nervous that I probably was never coming back. Let's mm. be honest.
people get afraid. Wow. It's just, the, and I didn't, there was no one like me, right? So right. I was like, if I say this, they're going to be like, she's not, she's not coming back. And so I just didn't go. And wow. it was one of the greatest regrets. So this time I've learned to say yes. Mm. Life is short. You ask me a question. You ask me to come out. Yes, mm. I'll be there. I'll figure it out. Mm. And so I said yes. And I went this time to my boss and she was like, go to a new boss. And, and it was difficult, you mm -hmm. know, to get to the DRC. You have to go through all these countries, and there was all these travel, like, the story was ridiculous, so many travel issues. I mean, like, you had to do, let's see, I had to get a visa to two countries, and then you were supposed to do New York, Brussels, Brussels into Bujumbura in Burundi, drive through Rwanda to get to the DRC in Bukavu in the Congo. We had travel drama. So we ended up doing New York, Philly, Philly, Kenya, Kenya, Burundi, Burundi, Rwanda, into the DRC, into a village, into the Congo. Wow. Yes. And it was crazy. But what we learned was how to work together. Mm. She put her faith in me to, to like do mm -hmm. this. And Rosario and I learned that we could do this together because we had trust. But also we met the women who had been through so much trauma. I mean, the worst rapes I've ever heard. I mean, things that are, because it's used as a weapon of war, like the, mm. the worst stories I've ever heard. And they were joyful and they were smiling and they wanted that city to succeed. And they mm. built that city and they did the work and they wanted to do this for their kids, kids, kids. And they would buy things like uh, farmland through donations and they would farm cassava and feed their kids and mm. send their kids to school. And to me, it was the first time I saw what true kind of sustainability looks like. And what it looks like when you empower a dollar and how she takes control over her community. Yeah. And that you can't be in those communities. It's too far away. Like, how are you going to get to those places? Right. You have to let people do it themselves. So that's when I had gone from, like, I like to say this kind of top-down approach where I thought, I have this great idea, I'm going to do it, to it doesn't work like that. It's got to come bottom up. Like, mm. the people need to tell you what needs to be mm. done. And so it switched. And so I switched to, like, it has to be like this. Yeah. And so it's kind of... That's really when studio, when I was kind of really born, and I wrote a plan, so you have to write a plan, <laughs> wrote a plan, um, to create this space and this platform called Studio A9 that was gonna do this. And then I went back to my job, so I was living in Milan, and the Caring Group has a foundation for women's dignity and rights. Mm -hmm. And they asked me if I wanted to mentor an organization in Uganda that makes washable sanitary napkins for girls that skip school when they have their period. Like, girls need another reason to get sent mm -hmm. back. I'd never even realized that was such a big issue. So I was like, yes, hopped on a plane to Uganda, into the village. And what I saw was this incredible company that makes, like, local material. Mm -hmm. Local girls get their first jobs, sold locally to places where people don't go, mm -hmm. knocking on the doors. And, like, a girl has to make the decision about her sexual health that will change the rest of her life. Wow. And so for me, it was very powerful. So I went, I quit. I was you quit. Like, I quit. When did you quit? Then I went to Uganda, came back. I'm done. And I mean, it was maybe like a few weeks later, but basically I was done because, you know, I was being called. Yeah. I had been there for almost a decade. No one ever talked about Africa. And now in the short span, Here it you was go. like- Back to back. Ghana, Uganda. Now I'm in, uh, sorry, Congo. Now I'm in Uganda. Right. And then I went on a trip in uh, in Zambia. Like, and then I, it was Kenya. You just knew. And it just, people were, and I was like, and I was answering the call. And I kept going. Yeah, and it was time. It's This is now, we're doing this. So we hear this, right? Mm -hmm. And it sounds like this was an easy, easy decision. No. Horrible decision. What? Harvard cried, stressed. So, so, <laughs> so, so, what did that moment feel like yeah. when you knew there was something that was calling you? Because I could, I could literally feel it in my body. Yeah. When I think about when I was resigning from my job. Oh my god. And getting and resigning uh, from getting that really nice check every mm -hmm. other week. I can even feel it now. What I felt mm, then. What pain. What was that? What was that feeling like? Can you paint a picture for us? Yeah, it looks a little bit. <laughs> no, but I mean, you you gotta like you gotta think about everything you're about to give up. You know, yeah. you're thinking about like first of all, the world's gonna think I'm crazy. Like, and probably some people are telling you you're crazy. Right. You know, like 
I, I how think, many people get the opportunity to go work in Milan for caring? I had, I even had a, a boyfriend at the time who was like literally mad at me. Like he yeah. wouldn't talk, he almost would not talk to me because he was like, this is crazy. He was European and like they have to, you know, jobs are, yeah. he's like, this is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what are you doing? It's so, un. we don't know what's in front of you. Yeah. And you know, you have like torment and all these things and you start to do the math. The math never adds up because it makes no sense. Nothing is going to work. It makes zero sense what you're trying trying to accomplish. And you know, and you're I if you pray, you're praying, you're talking to maybe close confidants. But in the end, it's like you have to do it. Like if you if it's something you love, as if you're in love with somebody or if you you just you can't do anything else. Yeah. Like it's the only thing I can think of. It's the only it's thing the that only makes thing. sense that makes absolutely no sense. And and I and I know. Yeah. Like sometimes you don't know and yeah. sometimes you just know. Like yeah. I'm going that way. Yeah. What is that way? I don't know. Yeah. I can see it. Yeah. I know that you can't see it. Yeah. I know that it's not there. Yeah. But I know that that's the way I'm going yeah. and I would like you to come, but yeah. if you don't want to come, I'm still going that way. Yeah. And, and, and staying with almost make you sick oh i have no there's no other option yeah i can't stay yeah and when i try you know like i i remember i used to listen to that song man i love this song when i was little but i listened to it at that time in my life michael jackson's man in the mirror which mm. is i'm gonna make a change for once in my life and that whole idea of like you're looking at yourself and putting the mirror back at yourself mm -hmm. i was in i was feeling like that mm. i was like who i you know when i make a decision like that i have to Think about when I have to look at myself five or 10 years from now, who am I looking at? Mm. And if I don't like the person that I'm looking at, then I'm not making the right decision. Mm. And even if it hurts, I have to know that's like integrity, right? Yeah. Like I have to know that in that one moment, in that split decision, yeah. when I didn't know the answer, that was the best course of action. Right. And that that's just it. So it's, it's just like, if it's something you really think is important, even if you don't know the answer, you, you got to do it. Yeah. You got to find out. And then the worst thing, it didn't work. Right. It didn't work. You failed. And also, I don't believe in failure, so I don't think you did. I think you had a life lesson. But yeah. It didn't work. You pivot. Yep. You take the experience and you apply it to something else. Yeah. And I think it also, for me, I think it applies for some, like for people who are afraid in a corporate scenario, yeah. too. Because wouldn't you prefer to hire someone who now knows? Yes. <laughs> Instead of someone who's sitting at their desk who's constantly wondering. Wondering. Like Absolutely. this person knows what it's like to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. This person knows what it's like to, to work with no money at all. Yep. And how to create something where there's nothing. They yep. have vision, they have passion. Yep. And also they also know the pain and they came back, so they're not going anywhere. <laughs> right. You know what I right, mean? Right. Like you are you have like so I think it's okay. Yeah. But I but I know it's not a, an easy decision and you know, sometimes I speak on panels when I, I people get inspired and they go like, I'm going to quit my job. Like, don't quit your job. Right. <laughs> you don't have to quit your right, job. Right. You know, I think I had to do it at the time because there was nothing like what I was trying to do yeah. that I could look to. Yeah. If I could have a partner, and I really didn't look for it. That's why I said, you do it. I'll just help yeah. you. If I could have had someone who was already doing it, I'm sure you feel like yep. that too. Yep. I would have been more than delighted. Yep to do it with them and to stay where I was and to grow in my career. Let me tell you. Right. I remember I used to have conversations with God like, I am not the right person for this. Mm -hmm. And I would tell him, but this one is great. Yeah. And that one could be <laughs> great. It. You do and it. And this one could be great, That's you right. know, because it's a it's a it's a lot. It's, it's a lot. calling, but it's it's also it can it can be heavy. We talked a bit around Studio 189. Can mm -hmm. you, like, in a concise sentence, give us, like, what is Studio 189? It's a fashion brand. It's a lifestyle brand. We, we basically focus on artisan products. So I, I focus on um, making artisan products as a way of impacting the value chain. And we work in developing economies, mostly Ghana. We sell in the United States and worldwide. And we try to preserve culture and do it in a modern way. And it is and building circular supply chains. And it's absolutely beautiful. Thank you. It's absolutely beautiful. I love this story because people again look at you and they're like, I pretty much just knows what's going on, and she's got Rosario Dawson as a partner, and but they don't really understand what you have to give up a lot <laughs> in order to 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 do this. And still. And still. Every day. And still. Yeah. And still. Um, what are you guys working on now? Oh, um, well, let's see. So me personally, I also work at Parsons, as you know. Yes. Uh, because I think doing this type of work, 
education is just fundamental. Yeah. Like when you, if you can train somebody else, whether it's somebody who didn't have the opportunity or someone who has all the opportunities, but for a bit of empathy mm -hmm. to understand how they can work together in a future and also learning from new generation ideas and how you can work together. Yep. So I'm a huge like education pusher. <laughs> I love academia. Um, so that for me is a big thing. Um, what do you teach at Parsons? I teach different courses. I okay. teach entrepreneurship. Okay. I teach retail service design. I created a course with one of my colleagues called AI, the Metaverse, and the Future of Fashion. Wow. That was a fun course. I'm excited. Can I sit in that course? You can sit on okay. the course. Um, and I run an institute called the Gromek Institute for Fashion Business. But, you know, right now, for Suma and I, we're, we're producing our current collection. So it's mm -hmm. shipping to stores. Um, so Bergdorf Goodman yep. and these, these stores that we love that are great partners. And then also, you know, I have a lot of um, personal Studio Way 9 projects that I want to do that I've been kind of like the burning thing sitting mm -hmm. in the, uh -huh. <laughs> sitting on my uh -huh. shoulder, like uh, projects that I would really like to see flourish that might not be specifically about making clothes, but that are interconnected into what we're doing. Because, you know, we're about 10 years now, as you know, and it's so beautiful because you see so many other brands mm -hmm. and also like probably people are better or other are different, you know, that are like either like kind of learned from it or came up with something else. Mm -hmm. And how do we get to the next 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how, how do we move forward together? And so if I do a lot of kind of thinking about also kind of uh, the blueprint, yep. you know, like what, like the questions you're asking, but maybe more broad yep. and, and longer, you know, what have I learned? What can we write down? What can we pass forward? And how do we pivot and change? Because yep. the world is changing. Absolutely. And it's really... So I love you so much. I love the work you do so much. It is so critically important to me that we all stand the test of time. Yeah. So often I can't like I can't stress that enough. That's why like working together is so deeply important. So often I so many great incredible brands we come and we go. We come and we go. We come and we go. Yeah. We come and we go. And you do this great thing with network and capital, but there's still all this other stuff that has to happen. Like yeah. we need legislation. Yeah. You know, you yeah. need workers' rights. Yeah. You need all these other things that have to happen to make it so that, you know, brand XYZ, we get to 20 years from now. Yeah. And not just like scraping by, but we're killing it. Yeah. And where our kids have opportunities and where we have housing and real estate yep. and all these things. So like I do a lot of like what's next. And like, but from a really like bigger point of view because you know clothing love beautiful but sustainability wise like where are we going to be in five years yeah as a, yeah. you know as a, as the earth right for our children you know is it is it going to be sustainable to keep using cotton probably not you right. know like so i really kind of do a lot of bigger picture thinking and i think right now i'm a very and probably like spinning off of grief yeah. but in a very reflective mode yeah. um so that's where i am yeah. and then for the the people that i work with uh, they they too right like their kids are older than they were you know and like thinking about what's next for them and how do we continue to grow the communities that we work yep. with um and I, one of the ways that I think it's going to be important is to kind of fortify a foundation, like an actual yep. foundation for them, because training and education is fundamental. That to me is going to be the difference between all these pop up, whatever. Like you have a great idea, but what's next? How do yeah. you create the tools? How do you keep How do you it? keep it? How do you write How the business plan? It? And it's How not... do you operate it? Yeah. How do you execute it? Yeah. How do you make sure that you're not spending all your money? Like, can you invest it and spend off the top and not yeah. spend all your money? So just all of these. And how do you move as legislation changes? And are yeah. you ready for that? So yeah. thinking about that. It's, 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 it's a lot to think about. We talked about entrepreneurship, right? Um, and you built this amazing company. And I know it's not easy and it's still not easy. Was there a moment where you were like, I'm done? Every day. <laughs> Every day. Am I supposed to say? Oh my, you can, no, I want you to be honest. I think it every day. <laughs> <laughs> what keeps you going? The, the, the universe. It won't let me stop. <laughs> One, I have this crazy, burning, ambitious, I'm like a driven, ambitious person. Yeah. But honestly, it's not even just that. It's literally people and community. Yeah. I, I feel like this is not, I'm done. And then 
something will happen. Something that I needed to clear will clear. Yeah. You know, I've had, I remember I've had moments where I'm like, we don't have any more money, I'm finished. <laughs> I'm done. And then someone will be like, hey, I have this great thing. It's $25,000 and it's easy, da, da, da. And then I'm like, oh, great. I can pay everybody. <laughs> and it's just, it's just this random phone, you know, like right, these. Right. And it, Brandis, it happens all of the time. Like it happens right. every time I think I'm done, the universe swings something towards me. What It doesn't only have to be about money. And it, and you're like, yep, yeah, nope, not done. You know, wow. this was facilitated. Right, and right. so I'm not done. I wow. think I think I'll know when I'm done. And, yeah. I, and I know it's not yet. Yeah. And I think it's a combination of the universe and also the people that we work yeah. with and who are maybe the universe is talking through them mm -hmm. because they too will show up. With wow. either like out of nowhere, like I just want to see how you were doing, you wow. know, like someone who I'm trying to help wants to see how I'm doing, yeah. you know, or like uh, something they'll say or do that will remind me oh. that we're not done yet. Or they will tell me, no, we're, we're not, not done. We're not done. They're not done and you're not done. And I it's, love yeah. that. Yeah. I feel like we're not done yet mm -mm. is like how we're going to close this. Yeah. You're not done yet. Nope. And I want to encourage everyone to go check out Studio 189 and shop the brand. It is so incredibly beautiful. Thank you. And beautifully made. Thank you. And when I'm wearing it, I know I'm like wearing the story that, you know, I tell people that all the time. I'm like, you're not just wearing clothes, you're wearing people's stories. You're wearing the story, you're wearing the hard work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I feel that when I'm wearing Studio 189. Well, we love it. And I think it's it's the people wearing it, yeah. right? Like it's the it's this dance between the, the way it's made, yep. the materials that go into it, the raw materials, the colors, the prints, the patterns, but it's the people, you yeah. know, like the people help finish that story. Yep. And when you wear it and you don't want to throw it away and you pass yeah. it to somebody else, yeah. like that's what I love. Yeah. 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 It's beautiful. Thank yeah. you so much, Abrina, for being here with Thanks us. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you. I appreciate this was you. so good. I love you. Hello, Buck. And <laughs> that's how you know it's mine. Oh my gosh. Thank you so I, much, Abrina. I I I love you. Okay, I love you from close. I love you from afar. Mm -hmm. I think one of the greatest gifts, also from I learned at Studio One Eighty Nine, and I know you have this, is people rooting for you when you don't know they're rooting for you. People in the DMs, people in rooms that are talking so positively on your behalf, mm -hmm. and rooting for you when you don't know they're rooting for you. I have had the pleasure of realizing people do that with me. And they also check me if they think I should be doing something better. But that means that they're on our team. And I've sat in rooms when you're not there. And I've seen so many people root for you and talk about you and say, let's we should call Brandis for this. And you are loved and you are loved because you lead with purpose. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to do this. And I just, I really, you know, whether this is stays in or stays out, you don't have to do this. You didn't have to do this for us. You don't have to do this for other people. You did this from your heart. I remember you since you started. You're constantly like using opportunities that are presented to you to make space for other people. And specifically, I remember in the pandemic when um, we were all crying and hurting and you got that grant from the CFTA or from the Common Fund or whatever that was, Common Thread or whatever. Um, and you gave back to all of us and allowed us, it really like, it was one of the things that helped many of us sprint. You know, it was that bit of money we needed to do those things we needed to do. And you, when I know you had your own stuff, I'm sure, you still were so laser focused and making sure that people didn't fail. And then all of our communities don't fail because we had people that were waiting for us and you didn't let us fail. And because you didn't let us fail, they didn't fail. And like Brandis, there's not enough flowers I can give you. That There are not enough. I hope that they write movies and see. I do, I hope in the future they sing your song and they write your praises because you're consistent. And you're consistent, no, I'm serious. And you're consistent with the same with with new people and the same people. A lot of times, people do this thing where they pop up new people all the time. This person's great, and then and then tears later, it's another person. Brandis calls you back. 
<laughs> for de decade. And I don't care if you are senior, senior, junior, 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 Brandis, Kevin's vet, and most time people offer you things. No, you deserve it. Most of the times people offer you things, huge companies that have lots of money and they don't pay you. And I don't need to get paid. I mean, I'd love to get paid, but I don't need to get paid. But Brandis always offers. Always, can I send you a car? You don't have to send me a car. Can I send you a car? Do you need something? Are you okay? Do you need something? Can I get you? You don't have to do that, but you always do it. You do it for everybody. And Brandis, you deserve it all. I love you. Thank you for having me. I hope everyone supports Brandis because I support Brandis. And also documenting our stories. Yeah. That's one of the reasons I always say yes to things. Our stories are not documented. Yeah, they're not. They have never That's been. Why we started they are this. stolen. Okay. They yeah. are not documented. They're yeah. appropriated. They are changed. Yep. And you are doing the Lord's work. Thank you. And I love you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Fashion and Color Podcast. I want to thank our production partner, PBA Entertainment. The Harlem's Fashion Row team, thank you so much for your support of Harlem's Fashion Row and for your support of Designers of Color. Please be sure to leave us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform and be sure to share this with a friend. Welcome to the HFR movement.